Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God, our Father, and our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ, the living bread from heaven. Amen. Did Jesus really say? Maybe that sounds a little familiar and it brings back some thoughts from all the way back at the beginning of the Bible in Genesis when Satan asks that very question to Eve. Did God really say? There are things in the Bible that God teaches us and tells us all the way back in the beginning up until the time of Jesus, up until today, that can be hard to hear or don't make sense to us. Now the devil knew that and that's why he chose that avenue of attack. Did God really say, I mean look this fruit, it looks so yummy and tasty and You'll gain the knowledge of good and evil. What could be the reason that God prevents you from doing this? Did he really say that? But Jesus, he continues that in the nature of God, saying things and asking us to do things and describing things to us that either we don't understand or challenge us or we wish wouldn't be true. The sort of things that when he says them, you wish, couldn't you just stick with that unconditional love and forgiveness stuff? But nevertheless, he says it anyways. So here are a few of those hard sayings of Jesus to jog your memory. The first is from Matthew chapter 5. You've heard, it, you've heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? Or maybe Matthew chapter 7. Enter by the narrow gate... For the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction, and those who enter by it are many. For the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life, and those who find it are few. Or Luke 14, 26. If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Or John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And lastly, from our reading today, John 6, verse 53, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Some of my northern friends might say, oofta. Those are hard things to hear. Tough sayings from Jesus. And they prompt that question almost automatically. Is he really saying that? Does Jesus really want me to do that? Is that what he really is calling me to do? Well, in our gospel reading today, we have one such teaching. I read just one of the verses of it just a moment ago, but Jesus really doubles down and mentions that multiple times. Maybe you even got uncomfortable saying flesh and blood over and over again while we were reading the gospel together today. Because it's not something easy to talk about. But before we get into the specifics of the gospel reading, I want you to take a step back and really think about that in the context of your entire Christian life. This idea that God is calling you in Jesus to a wonderful gift, but that comes with difficulties. And if we step back and think about it, it's not as rare as we might think. In the children's message, I referred to one such instance that happens every week, the confession of our sins. That's not an easy task. Because in order to confess our sins, we have to confront the reality about ourselves that we are enemies of God that we do wicked things on a routine basis. And if you don't think that's difficult, then I'll challenge you next week to say yours out loud. We don't want people to know about that stuff because we ourselves are ashamed by them. 
See, now that we're in Christ, we're different from the rest of the world. We don't follow the world's ways or the world's wisdom. And many of you know that causes division. It causes division among friends. It causes division among family. How many of you have family members that your faith has caused a rift in between you because you've clung to Christ? How many of you have family members or friends who have made decisions and done things that you couldn't in good conscience agree with because they violate God's word? And then you're left with the difficult position to love them and cherish them and pray for them, but disagree with the choices they make because you know that those choices are drawing them away from the one who can save them, Jesus. Not an easy place to be. Not for the faint of heart. How can we maintain our faith in the midst of such trials and tribulations, in the midst of so many things being said by our God and by our Savior Jesus that are just so difficult? Well, our gospel reading today has some insight for us in the answer to those questions. Now, just to kind of catch us back up, this is the third week in a row we've been in John chapter 6. And I don't know if you noticed, but they link them together by having the last verse of the previous week as the first verse of the next week's reading. So this is a narrative that goes together. And I'm just going to sort of summarize where we've been real quick for you so that you can kind of see where this trajectory is going. So at the beginning, it started out with a bunch of people who were part of the feeding of the 5,000, chasing after Jesus because they wanted to get some more of that food, right? And so they come to Jesus, and they're hungry, and they want Jesus essentially like, hey, Jesus, can you make that bread again? And Jesus' response to them is, don't struggle after temporary food, but after a food that endures to eternal life, to which their response, pretty logical response is, Give us this bread always, please. And then Jesus says, I am the bread of life that has come down from heaven. And then they're confused. And they wonder, what is he talking about? Does he mean literally? Is he speaking figuratively? How does this make sense? And then he says, the first verse in our reading today, this bread is my flesh. Well, that answers that. Certainly doesn't solve their confusion, though, because that then prompts the question we started our meditation with, did Jesus really say? Well, right about now, the reaction of the Jewish people, and we find out the disciples of Jesus who've been following him for some time, are having that question pop into their minds. Come again? What did you just say? We are going to eat your flesh? Did Jesus really say? And the way that's phrased in the text is they grumble and it says they ask this question, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? Well, let me ask you, have you ever said something, maybe you didn't word it right or maybe you were upset and it didn't come across the way you intended and so the person who heard it misunderstood. And then maybe they asked a sort of question like that, excuse me, what did you say? And we know then that that question is an opportunity for us to clarify, right? To say, oh, no, 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 that's not what I meant. What I meant was dot, dot, dot. So they ask Jesus this question. But Jesus' response is not to clarify a misunderstanding. Here's what Jesus says in response to that question. He says, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Jesus doesn't back up and say, no, 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 that's not what I meant. He clarifies by saying, you heard me correctly, and let me explain it even more. He doubles down. And think about that for a moment. This is a potentially disastrous misunderstanding. I mean, this isn't something you hear every day. It's hard to grasp. It's even harder to accept. But Jesus doubles down. And it's not just the idea of cannibalism here that is freaking them out, although that would be enough to do it. But listen to these words from Leviticus 17 about Old Testament cleanliness law. 
If any one of the house of Israel or of the strangers who sojourn among them eats any blood, I will set my face against that person who eats blood and will cut him off from among his people. For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it for you on the altar to make atonement for your souls, for it is the blood that makes atonement by the life. Therefore I have said to the people of Israel, no person among you shall eat blood, neither shall any stranger who sojourns among you eat blood. So these are all the Jewish crowd is hearing Jesus now say that they have to eat his body and drink his blood. Now, of course, we know the whole story. He's referring to our participation in the sacrifice on the cross. So the blood that we consume, that is Christ's, is in reference to verse 11 there where he says, For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it for you on the altar to make atonement for your souls. That is what Jesus is doing on the cross. And Jesus then goes on and repeats this in multiple ways and expounds on it in the next four verses. Right? We just read that together. He says flesh and blood quite a lot. And now we see that the battle between the listener's reason and faith in Jesus starts to really take off. Because Jesus is now saying something that's difficult to hear and hard to understand. And here's what the text says, not just about the crowds, but about the disciples who have been following after him. When many of his disciples heard it, they said, this is a hard saying. Who can listen to it? Maybe you have asked yourself that question when you hear a particularly difficult teaching from the scriptures, or your faith calls you to make great sacrifice in personal relationships or in public opinion. This is a hard saying. Who can listen to it? Who can endure it? Did Jesus really say? Well, there's really only three possible ways to respond to somebody who you trust deeply, at least up until they started talking crazy things. And you hear them say something you don't understand. There's really only three ways to respond. One is, you are crazy, I am leaving. And in the text, many of his disciples do exactly that. It says, many of his disciples turned back and no longer walked with him. These weren't just the crowds that were there listening to this particular teaching of Jesus. These were people who have been with him for a while. But this is too much for them. So that's one way. The second way is that we then say, "Eh, he didn't really mean that. right?" And then we soften the words or adjust the teaching to a level that we can stomach and understand. Actually, communion is a great example of that. Here in the Lutheran Church of Missouri Synod, we believe communion is a sacrament where the body and blood of Jesus is truly present. We don't claim to be able to explain to you how that is. We say that it is a glorious mystery of God. And we believe it because Jesus said it. But there are people who have heard that the words of institution, they hear that Jesus says, this is my body and this is my blood. But then they think, is Jesus really saying that? He's not really saying that. He's, it's more like a representation or something that we can refer to that will remind us of what Jesus has done on the cross. And so they lower the level of the language to a, a place that they can understand. So that's the second one. The third one is, wow, that is hard to hear. I'm not sure I can do that, or I don't understand. Yet it must be true because you are the Lord, the Holy One of God. This is the response that Peter and the 12 disciples give to Jesus. As all of these disciples are leaving, Jesus turns to the 12 and he says, are you going to go as well? And notice Peter doesn't say, oh no, this makes perfect sense to us. Because there is absolutely zero chance they understand what Jesus just talked about. And the only reason that you and I can sort of get it is because we know the rest of the story, but they're not there yet. But notice that Peter doesn't refer to his understanding 
or his ability to grasp what Jesus just said as why he stays. But he says, it's because you're the Lord, the Holy One of God. It's because we believe in you. This is our response by the grace of God and the Holy Spirit. Because faith in Jesus is not something we can come to by our own reason and understanding. Right In the small catechism, Luther says that we are called, gathered, enlightened, and sanctified by the Holy Spirit. Right In the text earlier, he refers to this as the Father drawing us to him. So what is the basis for your faith in God? Why are you here today? Is it because you understand fully everything God says, everything he does, and everything he asks you to do? Or is it because you have believed by the grace of his Holy Spirit that he is God? We had a men's Bible study yesterday, and one of the comments in there really stood out to me, and that was that the truth is a person. That's what Peter is confessing here, is that you're the truth. I can't go anywhere else and find it. So even if you say something as the truth that I don't understand, I have to deal with that because life is nowhere else. Truth is nowhere else. So Peter and the Twelve give us a beautiful example of how to respond when life gets hard in faith. When we hear the scripture passages that are difficult to understand or just ask very difficult things of us. But here comes the part about Jesus that we like. That we really understand. Are you going to be able to do all of these difficult things that God asks you to do? No. You're not. I'm not. No one is. But this is why Jesus has come. This is why his flesh is the bread of life come down from heaven. Is that he kept all of those in your place. And he's offering up his very own blood on the altar of atonement on the cross so that you no longer have a life that is destroyed by sin, but one that is eternal. For he has given you his very own life through his blood through the sacrifice of his body. So, dear brothers and sisters in Christ, the next time that you hear a difficult teaching from God's word that you don't fully understand, trust in your Savior Jesus, for he is the Holy One of God. The next time you're at odds with the world for following Christ, take heart because the words that Jesus speaks to you as he tells us today, our spirit and life. And he has overcome death and the world through the very gifts he gives you from his table today. So cling to that, even if it means the unfortunate consequence of sin and division among your family, among your friends, or a falling in your public opinion. The next time your faith is hard to maintain, Perhaps you're in the midst of enduring many of these things as I speak to you today. You're in the right place. Come to church. Hear God's word. Be strengthened and encouraged by that gift. And be encouraged and strengthened in your faith by the gift of the body and blood of Jesus given for you today. Because they are true food and true drink. And whoever eats of them will never die, but be raised up to eternal life on the last day. Did Jesus really say? Yeah, he did. But when things get tough, the disciples have, by virtue of the Holy Spirit, shown us the right answer. To whom shall we go? That answer is Jesus. Because he is the only one with the words of eternal life. In the name of Jesus. Amen. May the peace of God, which passes all human understanding, guard your hearts and minds in Jesus in the midst of those trials and struggles of faith until he comes again in glory to make all things new. Amen.